Well, good morning. It's uh, great to be back to Telcon uh, in a year when a lot is happening. So the topic today is the ongoing challenge for New Zealand's vertically integrated telcos and what should the new strategies and business models look like. Uh, to be honest, I'm not that keen to share ideas about new strategies and business models in a room full of competitors. Uh, but I am happy to comment on the challenges facing us and to make some observations about their implications for the future. Indeed, the question posed is not the easiest to consider in this industry, one that is characterised by seismic change in technology and social norms and behaviours. The latter, I guess, is best illustrated by the explosion of activity in social media and gaming, and such as the phenomena of Angry Birds. So hands up who's played Angry Birds. Come on, some of you have just been shy, and those who haven't, you must try it. It is a tremendous lot of fun and incredibly addictive. I think last year, 500 million downloads of Angry Birds. Uh, if you like, our household Angry Birds toys suddenly appear with my children. Uh, and there's going to be an Angry Birds theme park as well, believe it or not. To be frank, in my view, our industry and its ecosystem is inherently unstable, and uncertainty is its dominant characteristic. I'd suggest that we're in what the proponents of the theory of punctuated evolution would call an event. And as luck would have it, I was once an evolutionary biologist, uh, and this convenient juxtaposition allows me to consider this inconvenient truth in the context of evolutionary theory. So my thesis today, I guess, even if I have one, is that we're playing a high-stake game, placing bets on technology and associated strategies in the face of rapid and environmental uncertainty. Yes, success is likely to be the product of well-considered strategies, but under these conditions, it is just as likely to be the product of serendipity and random events. In making such a statement, I should add a rider that as in the study of ev everything evolutionary and geological, timing and predictions of timing are generally unreliable and deeply misleading, especially in respect of the use of our own lifetimes uh, as some type of calibrating measure. So I can say with absolute scientific certainty that the volcano known today as Lake Taupo will erupt again soon. Statement is sure to provide, provoke anxiety, not just amongst owners of Telpo holiday homes or North Island real estate agents, and given the statement in Picago, it's looking particularly good at the moment. However, the pivotal word is soon. Given the last eruption was some 1,800 years ago, soon could mean tomorrow, or perhaps tomorrow plus a few hundred years, uh, or perhaps tomorrow plus a few thousand years. Roughly translated, we would all be bloody unlucky if it erupted in our lifetime, so Invercargill can wait. Gee, you're a hard audience. That was one of my better jokes. <laughs> Far out. I'm going to have to get a new writer. I can see this. So while I'm content to talk about trends and make some predictions, perhaps I'm less swing line about the timing of such events or effects. And it would be nice for once today, please, media, for me to float some ideas and concepts without the media quoting us as saying the world is going to end and we're all going to become extinct. To the advocates of net neutrality and pairing, of which there are many in, the, in our industry, be warned, I'm going to offend your sense of internet religion. End of disclaimers, let's talk about evolution. As I tackle the everyday challenges of running a modestly sized telecommunications business in this economy and social environment, I'm regularly troubled by the thought that we're the proverbial frog in the boiling water. In fact, in the last few years, the water has literally boiled over as the government of various hues decided radical intervention was needed in the cooking process. If we're taking the evolutionary jungle as an example, this has been the equivalent of legislative asteroid shower for our industry. And whether or not one subscribes to the view that in evolutionary history, asteroids led to the extinction of dinosaurs, one can say again with some certainty that they were unlikely to have helped. Stephen Jay Gould and his colleague Niles Eldridge developed the concept of punctuated evolution, uh, sometimes known as punctuated equilibria, to explain what looked like long periods of stasis or, or no change in the evolutionary record, punctuated by so short, turbulent changes of massive and sometimes catastrophic change. 
guess where our industry is at present on my thesis. We're caught, I think, in a turbulent period of change, created not by, just by regulatory interventions, but by rapidly and dramatically changing technology advances and their impact on consumers and on communities. This type of severe, rapid, comprehensive change is difficult for large organisations and very difficult for telcos. We have, they have, complex internal systems, large customer bases, sunk investments in infrastructure, and long and material investment profiles. And that probably sounds a little ominous, perhaps a little dinosaur-like, well, perhaps, but let's not forget that some dinosaur-type animals found a model so successful they didn't have to continue to evolve. I do admit it will help their ongoing existence if crocodiles and sharks stop taking bites out of human beings, though. But being savvy business people, if I showed you a graph like this, you would rightly conclude that the business model this graph represents is toast. Long, slow revenue decline against a backdrop of increasing underlying cost, which means at some point profits become loss uh, and the lights go out. So let's think about telcos. Core business voice is declining annually at double digits. I used to cheer up John Allen and now Brian Roach by saying, if you think New Zealand Post has a problem with its core business, you ain't seen nothing yet. Come and look at our business. Uh, and they used to get a smile out of them. The proxy for cost, the increasing demand for bandwidth and data capacity, is not a bad proxy for cost investment in cash terms, and it's nearly becoming exponential. This is actually one of our graphs of capacity forecasting for our backbone due to consumer demand. It's nearly getting exponential, even though I don't believe it at times. Uh, but every year, as I write the check out again for the network augment, I'm beginning to believe the forecast. So true, Houston, we have a problem. At the same gathering a couple of years ago, I made the statement in the context of the UFB intervention that gravity always works. Economic realities will always come back to bite you. And I believe this would be true of UFB economics and the subsequent impact on our industry and the capital flows to and from it. You may not be surprised to hear that my views have not changed at all. The recent dance the industry has been having with Chorus over the Wholesale Services Agreement is testament to the fact that someone on their side has suddenly worked out the economic realities of the deal they've signed. But back to my main argument. The conventional wisdom of analysts and business commentators, of course, and it rolls off the tongue easy, is that telcos will replace voice revenue with revenue from network services and applications and by finding ways to monetize content and entertainment services. Sounds really good, but it's totally reflective of the said analysts and com commentators sitting outside the pot watching the frog boil. They're not inside the pot feeling what we're feeling. In the jungle of evolutionary change, it takes an awful lot of applications and services to make up voice revenues. And that's not to acknowledge that telcos have already been cuckooed by the over-the-top providers. In biological terms, cuckoos gain reproductive and evolutionary advantage by duping other bird species into raising their young. In effect, they're using the infrastructure and the energy of others to benefit their gene pool. And I'm not sure, if we go back, die, sorry, if we go back, I'm not sure why that mother hasn't worked out that there's something wrong with her offspring, uh, but clearly she's very short-sighted or has a very poor memory. In any case, in much the same way, YouTube, Google, Amazon and TradeMe and the millions of other over-the-top providers have created wealth for their shareholders by exploiting the networks that others have built and run. And this is a global issue. This is not a New Zealand issue. Clearly, this is a global issue. And the inequality of investment and return will have find a solution in either competitive actions or commercial outcomes. Proponents of net neutrality have little understanding of the underlying economics of the infrastructure that supports the internet and who's making the money. And in this context, it's worth noting that some birds, smart to the cuckoo strategy, push the eggs of the cuckoo out of the nest and smash them on the ground. Clearly some natural version of deep packet inspection. 
A similar theme also revolves around pairing, and it's got a sort of tragedy of the commons outcome that will see network infrastructure regarded by the, purview, by the few to be the purview of the many and become subject to ongoing lack of investment and eventual decay. I must say when I hear arguments about the wider good and the national need, I, I always know that outcome is going to cost my shareholders. Ours is an industry that requires considerable capital investment. Telstra Clear is very, very modest on global and even New Zealand standards. We commit $100 million, $100 million every year, for frankly a somewhat meagre return. The interventions we are now living with have altered the economic dy dynamics of our industry. They have split and diminished profit pools, and they're potentially undermining ongoing investment by private interests in the New Zealand telecommunications sector. For example, we've just calculated recently in the context of UFB that to survive as an acceptable commercial enterprise in this new environment, we have to cut our costs to serve our customers by over 50%. That's around 10 to $15 per customer per month in the next three to five years. Now, now some industries have done that. When I was in banking 20 years ago, our cost-income ratio was somewhere around 70%. Today, most banks are somewhere down near 42%, 44%. But that was achieved in a relatively stable industry, and it, was, it took 20 years, and it was achieved based on underlying scale economics through mergers and acquisitions and some technology change. My personal view is that the Telecommunications Amendment Act is the evolutionary equivalent of the... Um, of the Kelsey, Khaleesi virus introduction in the New Zealand rabbit population. An immediate imperative may be, have been addressed, but the long-term unintended consequences of this act are still to be felt and understood. And today, in some areas of central Otago, rabbit numbers are higher than they were before the virus was introduced. Interventions of this scale in markets are unlikely to be as successful as interventions in nature. And you can add to the virus the introduction of ferrets, gorse and deer, uh, if you want a few more other examples. The question of the long-term viability of the telco's model and the structural dynamics of the entire industry is an open one. I don't have the answers to it. We will see. Competitive and social pressures are not only seeing traditional revenue streams disappear, but revenues shift to other parts of the ecosystem, such as applications and contents. Whether you believe households or consumers have a set share of their budget, their wallet or their purse for telco, ICT or entertainment will determine or not your view on incremental or substitutable revenue and your view on future business strategies. According to the latest issue of Time magazine, for every minute that passes, 60 hours of video is uploaded on YouTube. The vol that volume results in 4,000 million views a day, or 1 million millions or trillion views a year. Or put it another way, 800 million users who watch 3,000 million hours of video a month watch the equivalent of 340,000 man years. Now that's the type of use that's driving the capacity on our networks and with it the associated cost. The kicker being we're not getting that type of incremental revenue to match. And I understand the current customer frustration with data caps and usage charges. It's understandable. But such views are in violent opposition to the physics and the economics of network infrastructure, whether they be HFC, copper or fibre. I'm on record stating that the, in the face of social change and behaviour of the new generation, securing and consuming content, the current business models of music and movie studios are numbered. I can't help but wonder if the same doesn't apply to many of us in this room. Telecom 2 may yet emerge as an aggressive and smart velociraptor in contrast to the old vegetarian brontosaurus days. But the fact is, it's still going to be a dinosaur. So it is difficult to predict your own extinction, particularly when you can still find enough food. That's especially true if you've lost sight of how much energy you're using to find that food. In the days of such content abundance and apparently insatiable appetite, this food and energy equation will become the evolutionary spark for massive change. So, before we come too depressed and reach for the Prozac, uh, we should reflect that our industry is an amazing one. 
evolution and extinction aside, it helps create wealth and it changes the course of people's lives through connection and the dissemination of ideas. Our industry has changed the world. It's a pretty exciting place to be. And today's social media is having an impact far beyond what could, many could have imagined. The power and of the young in social revolutions is as we've never seen before. If we think of a difference a cell phone would have made to Lord Cardigan and the Light Brigade, imagine the power of social media in unearthing and transmitting the horrors of the Nazi Holocaust to the world and the German citizens. The Greeks in the 4th century BC may have lamented the willful behaviour of their young, inflamed as they were by wild notions, but I'm not sure we can fully appreciate the global power and the voice of youth today, courtesy of our companies and our networks. Telecommunications and technology support and drive the democratic process, but they do come with some dangers. The denial of service attacks on Amazon and PayPal over WikiLeaks was a warning to corporate enterprises like many of us in the room today, as was the Arab Spring uprisings to oppressive regimes. Both a testament to the power now held by coming generations via our services and networks. Social issues and challenges play a part. I've been lucky enough to be involved with Save the Children and through that, the work of the World Economic Forum on youth and youth issues, especially employment. The old adage about idle hands is never truer than today. The United Nations World Youth Report 2012 estimates that there are 76 million young people unemployed around the world most in third world countries and in very volatile regions. I would suggest that most will have cell phones or some access to social media and clearly plenty of time on their hands. So the unintended consequences of our industry and its technology are reaching well beyond the borders of our companies and our industry and we should be careful we don't stumble into them like some Italian cruise boat captain. Our industry, our world is complex, unstable and uncertain, but it has such opportunity and excitement. It's hard to think of another industry which can be part of a revolution that placed James Kirk's communicator in everyone's hands. Now we just need the beaming up bit to go with it. So, it's a wonderful world and it's a tale of two cities um, and it's sort of, you know, in the best of times, the worst of times. So let's conclude with some predictions. As with all predictions, I will now predict that most of mine will be wrong. But after all, why should Nostradamus have all the fun? Prediction one. There will be another UFB intervention in the next three to five years to make the uptake of fibre compulsory, as in the MBN scheme in Australia. Prediction two. Barring the behaviour that drives predict prediction one, independent on it or itself, there will be some type of regulatory intervention, despite what the Minister says, in the next two years to encourage Sky TV to move away from its monopolistic behaviours. Prediction three, barring prediction two and by it prediction one, someone will be brave enough to seek a commercial resolution to the content problem or a competitive one by taking Sky on. Expensive and messy perhaps, but the pain is building. Prediction four, net neutrality will become the victim of economics or telcos will give up the network business. It's going to happen eventually. As in all these things are wrong, and they probably will be, uh, then in the face of such complex issues and environmental uncertainty, and with due apology to Charles Darwin, I would only say that things are going to change. Now that's a prediction I'm willing to bet is 100% right. Thank you.